Go ahead and get rolling. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right. So uh, we have all our panelists. We have our moderator. Uh, the one thing I'll say before we get going, actually a couple things. Uh, originally, we were, actually, we were going to be seated. There is not really an easy way for us to move the podium and then be seated while everyone can see us or not split awkwardly across the stage. So we're going to stand. Uh, Tim might sit. Uh, everyone submitted actually really, really great questions. Uh, there were only a handful that I uh, did not include in the batch that I gave to Tim. It is Tim's decision to use the questions as he sees fit. Uh, the questions that I pulled were specific to um, particular companies or platforms. Um, for example, uh, Edis Research User or Lime Suite. Um, so things that we cannot, well, some of us can, but things that we should not be representing right now during the panel. I pulled those questions, and but I'm going to make sure that those questions do get um, to people who can speak to them. So if you put your name on them, uh, you should you should get some follow up, uh, possibly here on stage later, so, not after the panel, but later later. So I asked, people also gave me questions, and I, I just held on like I, <laughs> I just held on to them. <laughs> I was doing this to draw. So yeah, can you give him? You give him I wrote one down. Well, yeah, yeah. He, he has one of them, and then, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, awesome. So. All right, well thanks Ben. All right, like he said, goal here today is to uh, talk to the GNU Radio project leaders here, not to specific companies. So that's what these questions revolve around. Um, so I'll be uh, asking these submitted questions and I may, after the fact, um, if it has a name written down, I might check and make sure that they answered the question properly from whoever uh, asked the question, just to make sure. Uh, yeah, it got done. But uh, so why don't we start? I mean, it, pretty much everyone recognizes these three, I'm sure. Um, they're offer, officers in the GNU Radio Project Foundation. I don't know what you, you call it, but why don't you go and describe specifically, real quick, what that means? Like, what is your officer position? What does it even mean to be an officer? I think that would be interesting uh, just right off the bat. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, all three of us, and I'll let each of you speak to your positions, but so all three of us um, have positions within the Good Radio Project itself, as we've defined our formal organization, as well as within the company, the Good Radio Foundation. Uh, so I'm the, the president and CEO, Jonathan's the CTO, and uh, Martin is, I think you're actually on the legal paperwork fired with the IRS, the secretary, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, he's a community secretary manager, Martin. I'll let him speak to that. Yeah, so we, we all hold fiduciary duties for the actual Gunner Radio Foundation. We also uh, are in charge of the Gunner Radio Project itself. I am also the uh, Free Software Foundation's maintainer for Gunner Radio, which means I in some way represent the Free Software Foundation as well as the Gunner Project. Uh, and I'm the one who interfaces with the organization that actually formally owns GNU Radio, because it is not actually us. The GNU Radio Foundation does not own GNU Radio, Free Software Foundation does. So I also represent them. Um, Jonathan? Uh, I have it easy. When, uh, when Tom left the project uh, and uh, Ben and I were talking about how we wanted to do things, uh, I said, I'll, I'll handle the software and you handle everything else. And uh, th that's worked out quite well for me, maybe not so well for you. Um, if you guys really would buy your tickets on time, it would be much easier. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I mean, my main role here, and it's evolved over the years, I've been involved with the project for 12 years now uh, in various capacities. <clears throat> but we have contributions from, I mean, we have a very diverse community of contributors. So we have people from uh, you know, ham radio operators and hobbyists to infosec experts, people doing uh, fundamental research in machine language um, or uh, machine learning. Uh, you know, there's, there's people of all different kinds of engineering skills contributing to the GUNI radio. And one of my main roles is to try to tie that all together into something cohesive. Um, in, in a commercial software environment where I come from, you know, you have roadmaps and you have uh, you know, people whose salary depends on conforming to that roadmap. Um, we don't have that in an open source project. We have volunteers that are doing things for whatever their motivations are. And they do things that, um, you know, that they want to do. Uh, and it's, it's difficult sometimes to sort of tie that together and take what we get and make it look like that's what we plan to do all along. Um, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, but that's mainly what I do with the foundation is, uh, is write herd on the, the software contributions and try to think ahead to where we want to be with the software and, and motivate and, and solicit contributions from 
uh, individual contributors or organizations that want to help us grow the software base. Yeah, so when, when Jonathan and I took over the project, the way we kind of defined it externally, I think we presented this last year at GRCon, was uh, any interfaces or relationships that Gunradio or the Gunradio Foundation has with any other external party, effectively I am, I am handling that. Uh, so I am handling all of the inbound stuff and Jonathan is uh, handling all of the technical software work, the, co the co actual core repository, and then feeding back up to me. I won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm a bit of the odd job guy. Um, and uh, when I started like becoming officially involved in the project, I was uh, dubbed the community manager, and I think that's a, it's, it's a good description, but it doesn't really like explain wh what I do. And um, there's, because it's a variety of things. And I'm just gonna give a couple of examples. So there's like GNU Radio Summer of Code is sort of a, you know, one of the things that I've been sort of managing uh, like basically since always. Um, and there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot of organizational like poking people that needs to be done for that. You know, I need like, there's like a, a group of, of uh, mentors that needs to be sort of held together and then assigned tasks, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, people need to be found for actual um, mentoring and also like then selecting the students and um, as the as GSOC um, goes along, there's like other things that need to be done and also to make sure that that happens. Um, there's, uh, I, I um, in the past, usually span, spun out a couple of task forces to help me with various things. When I say help me, I usually like, I actually mean like they did most of the work. Um, for example, like we, uh, when we had the, when we made the guided tutorials a while back, there was actually a sort of a coordinated effort that I sort of push along um, and I think they're, they're pretty good and they, they're well maintained now at this point that we don't actually, like I don't actually have to go and update them a lot because people just go into the wiki page. I don't know if you don't know, if you know what the guided tutorials are. If you do not, you should Google GNU Radio guided tutorials. They're excellent starting points for those who are beginners. And so there's very sort of things like that um, is what I usually handle. But then there's also a lot of overlap. Like I, um, I'm trying to help with the code reviews, um, for example, and um, stuff like that. I, I, will, I will point out, so I actually, uh, at one point I asked Martin if he wanted to change his title because community manager, uh, I think undersells it a little bit. So uh, if you're not familiar with open source projects, almost every major open source project has many, many community managers and it's because the responsibility within a community like ours uh, is, is critical. Um, if it wasn't for the fact that, if it wasn't for the community, it really just would be a software code repository that people silently use. Um, it, you know, the reason we're here is because of the community, fundamentally. Uh, realistically, I mean, probably the, a lot of people in this room could write a fur filter, right? Um, having one in the GNU Radio library is awesome, but uh, one of the benefits of participating in GNU Radio is not just that you get to use somebody else's fur filter. Uh, so community manager is extremely important. I just wanna make sure that you didn't undersell yourself. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. All right. First question is going to come from uh, Mr. Richard Bell. Are you in here? Mm. All right, excellent. So uh, if you were here in the morning, you heard Ben uh, making a plea for, uh, oh, we need more core developers. We need more people committing to the core. Uh, everything's going out of tree module, not a lot of stuff pushing back. So the first question is, how does someone start from scratch and learn how the GNU Radio Core works well enough to actually change it. And by that, I, I, I would take it all the way, change it, submit something, and you guys are comfortable enough with it, uh, maybe after multiple iterations, to accept it. Uh, what would be a good way for someone to start down that path? I, I think I already started answering that in my <laughs> introduction, so I'll just keep going. So you need to know how GNU Radio looks like and how it works before you can do anything else. So if you don't know anything at all, start with the guided tutorials. Um, and while you're doing that, that's a good time to get involved in the mailing list and, and ISC and or Slack, whatever you prefer. So um, the tutorials will give you like the meat of the information that you need to know. Like it'll tell you like run this command or like this code will appear and you can now do this. Um, and as questions come up, you wanna get involved with the community. The latter is, is very important. I'll, I'll come to that in a, in a minute. Now if you wanna get in the actual, involved in the actual core development, that is like you wanna start working on the scheduler, um, there is no way around diving into the source code, except Tom Rondo made a um, one hour sort of video slash presentation that he published somewhere on the web, you can find it if you Google it, that gives you sort of a good um, idea what's happening under the hood. But it's, it's really impossible to 
um, relate the complexity of like the, the schedule other than going in there. And really what you usually want to do, like the, re the motivation to do that is usually want to solve a specific problem. So, you know, at that point you need the help of IRC and or the mailing list to guide you to the appropriate files. Because um, and at that point you're, you're on your own really, you'll have to like look at um, selected areas of the C++ code, but at that point hopefully you've A, understood what it like should do once it's running correctly, and B, um, which files and maybe even which sections of which file you can you need to read to um, understand what's going on. So when, once you've narrowed it, that, that down, like now you just need to apply your C++ skills and you know start programming. Are there tutorials for changing core stuff and seeing what happens, or is it all mainly focused around building apps? No, there's none, and I don't think we'll ever have those because um, like the number of people um, who who read them will be always limited, and maintaining documentation is isn't it's a lot of work on top of like the code. And if it's like, um, for example, um, the PFB polyphase resample is a good example of a block that really needs good documentation. Otherwise, like if you have no D, if you have DSP background, you still won't be able to use that block if you don't understand what like the individual parameters are, and that's that's bad. But for the scheduler, like there's so much going on that like the code is 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 also the documentation. And by the way, if you see a piece of code that is like conceptually okay, but it's just badly written, it's totally fine to like go in there and like maybe like rename some of the variables or I don't know like fix comments or something. That that is that is a valid pull request and that is a really really good place to get started. Um, but like an actual document, like tutorial of the schedule, I don't think we'll ever have that. Why not? But you know, like because I said earlier, um, maintaining the documentation is a, is the same amount of work as maintaining the code itself for the people who are already involved well, in it. I mean, I'm I'm hearing the core. Well, Ben this morning say, hey, I wish we had more contributors to the core. But then I'm hearing, uh, well, we don't want to document the core. No. Like <laughs> well, we we have documentation. We have documentation. It's called the source code. And oh, um, please. We've all used that line. So, so, so that line is sometimes is, is not a valid excuse, and I think in that case it is. I, I, I think you'll find that the Linux kernel operates similarly, because like if you get down, is that true? Okay, Bart's already, just, just, yeah, okay, I'll take a different example. You guys swear less. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> no, I, I, um, like at some at some at some level of complexity, like documentation won't cut it, and if the c code is out there, then a it's either badly written, and then you need to fix that, or you know, or it's well written, and then you then then it's it's also serves as its own documentation. All right, Jonathan, get your thoughts on this. I mean, so Martin said most of what needed to be said. Uh, one of the things I would like to stress, particularly with uh, critical code like the the schedule in Segundi Radio. It's something that um, has been written and has been uh, survived, you know, 14, 15 years now. Um, not unchanged, but uh, the way it works and why it works, um, you know, has evolved because of the environment that it's in. We don't have a lot of documentation on it. Um, one of the things that we would like to do, and Marcus is gesturing at me, um, is actually do a formal state machine model and, and write that up. Uh, we get a lot of comments about that part of our code and how it might be changed, but they usually start with, we should make it do this. And what I don't hear, and what I'd love to hear is, this is what I can't do because it works like this, and this is what I want to do, so how do we change it? In other words, use case um, that says, uh, you know, this is insufficient for the kind of thing I want to do, so I need to change it. <coughs> then the engineering process of figuring out what the best way to change it can start. But without an endpoint that says, um, we need I need to solve this problem and I can't because of the way your code works. Uh, we don't have a roadmap to aim at. Otherwise, it just becomes a, you know, a computer science exercise. Well, that'll lead into my next question here from uh, Peter Mathis. Let's see, where's Peter in? Uh, okay, there you are. Um, so Peter's question or comment is, there's a lack of support and examples for using messages. And, and by that, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, you might mean GR event stream, which is a, a, you know, a different way to process bursty messages. I don't know if you want to explain it in, in your answer here, but as opposed to using streaming. So, I, 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 and out of trees exist of, you know, different ways of doing this sort of, like, in some way you could call it scheduling, um, but integration with the core would be better. So, in that case, there is a very specific thing that was written up that addresses a need that wasn't there 
in, in the core. It's an out of tree module. It's not been integrated in. Is that just because the developer that developed the out of tree thing hasn't made a pull request? Is that something that falls on you guys? I mean, that 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 is a big push in. I, I get that, and you're familiar with event stream. Yeah, I am. Uh, so that's. I mean, I'll go ahead and take that. Um, that's a difficult question because it's it's kind of a dance. It's a it's a cooperative thing where. John, when, when, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want to switch when, for the lavalier? I'm, uh, no, I'm good. All right. uh, when somebody uh, writes something out of tree, they're writing something that solves a problem of theirs on their computer. Um, they're writing something that um, they have full control over. So if they, they want to write it a certain way, they can. When we look at code that has to get integrated into the tree, um, we also have to look at how well does it get along with other things. Um, changes that it might require have to be thought out on their impact to other um, parts of the software. Um, would it have impact on users that weren't using uh, that out of tree module? And so there's, there's sort of a process of joint development. And a lot of the contributions we get that go into um, core software start out as, hey, I want to go do this. How, how would we develop this in a way that would be mergeable um, with the least amount of effort? Uh, and so that, that ends up with sort of a design question of, okay, well, how, how would this happen and all of that? Uh, we don't have the manpower, frankly, to um, do that process a lot. Uh, and so um, it's true that there's a lot of outer tree stuff that could get integrated into core that hasn't. Uh, and partly that's just because, you know, limited bandwidth um, to work with, you know, n number of people. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's a bit of a, I mean, it's just the reality of it. Ben? Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to think about how to, how to take what Jonathan said and kind of, and kind of go from there. Um, yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Uh, there are, there's a tremendous amount of outer tree mod. So let's think for a second about outer tree modules and kind of the two of the key things they provide. And there's more, but just think of them as two for now, which are outer tree modules that are built for a specific application. GR satellites, for example, um, or the LoRa stuff from the, from the Bastille hacker guys. Uh, these are four specific applications. And then there's stuff that kind of expands the infrastructure of Goodyear Radio, right? EventStream is a good example of it. Um, so I think what you're, so the kind of do, do, is it worth merging those two things? I think it's two separate questions. You're talking specifically about uh, things that expand the infrastructure or the runtime or provide, uh, provide capabilities that other application developers or other out of tree modules would use. Why not, why not integrate those and then build examples on them? Um, and you know, for that specific question, I honestly don't know that I have anything to add to what Jonathan said. Uh, it really is a question of how was it originally written and the manpower requirement of getting it merged. Um, if it was written totally in isolation and somebody comes kind of, you know, comes out of a basement and says, hey, I wrote this great, fantastic thing. Let's, um, I'm gonna throw it back at the community. Can you merge it into the, or can you upstream it? Um, that's a nightmare scenario for, for Jonathan um, because it very often, it, it, it breaks, it would break, if we merged it, it would break many things for many other users which is a huge problem for us. Um, if, it's a, if it's a situation where somebody has said, hey, I want to build this key piece of infrastructure uh, and then get it merged, I think that's when it goes well. So I think I answered a more general version of your question. You're asking specifically about message, messaging, message flows, event stream, and that sort of thing. I, don't, I can't really comment specifically on that. If you want to speak specifically to event stream before it. Um, okay, yeah, send back Did to you Peter? Did he address the question? Did, did they, was that good enough? Yeah, I can. Okay. Was, so, so no, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, so Jose does have a mic that he can run for you. Uh, so um, what I mean just as an actual use case, uh, pretty much any kind of packetized transmission needs some sort of a header. Um, so I'm thinking for you know teaching purposes that um, I can. I have an example of a, of a MAC header, for example. Uh, very simple. Uh, there's a source address, a destination address, uh, a, a number of the packet, and the length of the packet, and the CRC32 or something like that. And I can give that to my students and say, well, use that uh, to see some realistic example. 
I understand that you cannot just take any arbitrary out of tree module and, and integrate that. I would think of actually having something just tailor-made as an example that is universal enough that it can be, could be used for, for many different things. But not, you know, like a, an infinite expansion or so. It's just so that, first of all, um, a student can just go and use GNU Radio and doesn't have to fiddle with with actually the incompatibility that you're afraid of and can learn uh, what some of those things could be used for without being, you know, uh, using it uh, exhaustively or anything like that. So that's, that's what, where my thinking is coming from. So your question, um, I mean, you're, you're accurate in your assessment that we don't have that. Uh, the, the, the question in my mind is how would we get there? And it's not gonna be written by the three of us. Um, I don't really have an answer to how would we get from point A to point B, but it generally means somebody writing it and contributing it under our guidance on how to do that, uh, and somebody who has a interest in seeing that happen uh, and is motivated to uh, to keep that work going. Um, so you know, I don't know if that's you know within your group or if that's someone else that says, "Hey, I need that too. Let me go work on that." Uh, we tend to, when people come to us and say, hey, I would like to work on something, tell me how to do it, we will work with them quite a bit. When we get code that's, I did this, do you want it? We'll look at it, but if it's a significant amount of work, then we may or may not decide to upstream it. So, I, Tim, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll say, so, so it seems to me what you're really asking for, uh, it could be expanded in many other things, actually. You're saying, I'm developing curriculum for undergraduate and graduate students, like you said. Uh, I want them to be able to hit the ground running, building more complex systems, which requires the use of message passing. And right now, there are no examples within Gunner Radio to make that happen. So I'm stuck either developing my own or using something somebody else developed that's probably that might may or may not be compatible with the current version of Gunner Radio, and it just creates a huge mess, right? The, okay, all right. So generally, I'd say uh, one of the things, and this is actually if you think if you remember the presentation I gave earlier this morning, I talked about. You know, the three goals that I have for the project, one of them is layering, lowering the barrier to entry, right? Make the project more accessible. And I think reference designs are a critical part of that. Um, we have, we really, to be honest with you, we don't have much in the way of uh, complex reference designs, right? We have examples that show you how to use particular blocks, but not really reference design, but we don't have maintained reference designs for larger systems. And I think that's something we desperately need. Jonathan and I have talked about the Martin and I too. We've all talked about this before, um, and everyone is in, in violent agreement that we desperately need these things, especially if we are going to do things like make GNU Radio more accessible to people who have never built a packet modem before, but they're interested in learning how to do it, right? Having a running reference design is a good way to get started. And we don't have that, it's a huge gap. Um, and I think the harder question is, how do we find the manpower to get it done? One little addendum there is, like, the last two years or so, we've actually made a lot of progress in that area because um, we do have some examples now that do build packets. Um, it was like the early OPM code that had actually split up the packet generation, and then and Tom took that and made it into a more generic thing where you could um, swap out different modulators. And that's actually already merged. It's not, like, really quite, like, the full-blown example, but it's already pretty close. Um, I mean, this is, could be a sort of an undergraduate or even graduate level project, you know, and uh, I enc always encourage a academia to uh, get involved in that kind of, of thing, because I think, like, building that kind of example would not, like, destroy, like, the, the GNU Radio core or anything. That would, be, that would be, at this point, like, a fairly easy addition, and you could do something like, um, you know, take Bastian's 802.11 code, maybe, like, put that into a sort of more standard GNU Radio uh, thing and then, then merge out. I think that would be a, an interesting project um, to work on, so, you know? If anyone's interested, that's where we really need a lot of help. Thank you. All right, we'll switch gears a bit. I'll wait till these guys get done switching here so we can hear Jonathan. He can be recorded. We're good. I'm off the record. Uh, all, right. all right, this one comes from Manuel. Manual. Manuel. I knew that. Um, how, how can the open source community monetize applications so there is a business model to incentivize app developers? Get your thoughts on that. I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, so just a small problem. <laughs> yeah, a, a small one. Um, 
Okay, so speaking, I mean, speaking generally, right, there's a lot of models that exist and that other companies are using. Uh, there's the dual license model, which Edis Research uses, for example, right? Um, there is the open core model, right, where you, um, you know, you, you have a, a, a key set, or a key part of your software, the core piece of it that's open source, and you monetize things that sit around it. Um, there's the delayed description model where, uh, subscribe, premium subscribers who are paying you money get access to features that then open source customers only get a year later. Um, there's the, right, the, the probably the most prevalent model of selling support and services. Um, I think there's probably a lot of people in this room uh, who work at places that effectively sell services that in some way incorporate developing Guna Radio applications, right, and then supporting them. That's the support and services model. So, um, there's, there's a lot of these more generic open source models that you can find in the, in the, in the market. Um, I think one of the, one, actually, one of the questions that I would have for, for or Manuel, throwing it, throwing it back real quickly is, did you, did you want me to, were you interested in, in hearing a, more of an expansion on general monetization of open source or about within Guna Radio specifically and how you know, the people in this room can make money on, on Guna Radio, or how the Guna Radio, how, so is it about how people in this room can make money with Guna Radio, or is it about how Guna Radio, the Guna Radio Foundation can make money with Guna Radio? Um, no, I'm thinking more around the ecosystem, so, so the former. How do folks in this, this room that want to develop applications, I mean, you look at GR, you know, IEEE 802.11. Okay, mm -hmm. well, no one makes money off that. Should people be able to put something in there that makes money? How would they do it? How would they be incentivized to do it today, right now? Again, services and support is, is about the only way that people can do it. And, but that doesn't scale up to a product-based business. Mm -hmm. So that's the business model issue that I'm trying to figure out. How do we get this community in such a way that the applications can be monetized and it makes sense for them to invest their time and effort to do that? Yeah. Okay. That's a that's a really good question. Um, and yes, I think you're I think you're right uh, in your in your assumption that probably most of the people in this room who are making money doing GNU Radio development are doing it on a services basis, either a consulting for GNU Radio or or selling their services as GNU Radio designer. Um, uh, a Tom, for example, right when he was running running this project, uh, the way that he made a living was by being um, by being basically by being paid by Guna Radio users to develop particular features for the runtime, right? Um, so these are, these are all services, services models. So I can tell you the things that, that I know exist in the community first, um, A, services. Uh, B is, and I'm in no way uh, uh, saying that this is, this is, I'm not trying to advocate for this model, but there are, there are people, people who make money by circumventing the GPL um, so, just uh, for anyone who's real quickly, well, the, the reason that this is, that this question is interesting and difficult for Green Radio, if you're unaware, Green Radio is licensed under the GPL, which means that if you convey something that is a derived work of Green Radio or based on it or linked against it, you must provide the source code for your derived work. So, one of the way, and so Manuel's question specifically is, how can you monetize uh, a Green Radio application if you're giving your source code to your customers? Right? Why would they ever buy something from you again? Um, so, uh, one way that we've seen in the community is basically circumventing the license. And uh, there, you can do that through using IPC. Uh, and there are a number of people who, who do exactly that. Um, other methods, of, other methods. Uh, so first of all, and we talked, actually talked a little bit about this in the GPL tutorial that I gave earlier today, writing a particular um, if you write a, a, a block, for example, if you, if you implement some algorithm in GNU Radio, uh, you own the copyright to that algorithm. You can do what you want with it, uh, which means if you, use, if you develop it, you use it with GNU Radio, you can, when you actually sell it, you can sell it as a piece of proprietary software, right? You don't have to sell it as a packaged GNU Radio application. So that's an example of using GNU Radio within your workflow developing something against it, maybe building a system with it, but not delivering something that's going to radio based so that the key piece, that core IP, whatever your product is, um, is actually not subject to the, not subject to the GPL, right? Uh, some other, other items we've seen, and actually there was um, 
uh, a company that, that was trying to do this a little while ago. Uh, so, am I, all right, Tim's, Tim's telling me to hurry up. All right, I'll just give one, one other model. Uh, so a more popular one, and this is, you'll see this more and more, especially in the open source community, is basically selling, um, uh, you sell your time and infrastructure, right? Uh, so GitLab does this, right? You can use, um, uh, basically, you, you can download the source code for free, you can use it however you want, uh, but if you want somebody else to maintain your servers for you, you pay them to run the open source software, right? And there are a number of companies who are doing that um, using not just CPL software, but radio software as well. Uh, Coherent Logic, is that the name of it? Peter Thanis' group out of Virginia Tech. Um, this was the model that he was trying to use. Consolidated Logic. Consolidated, Consolidated logic. logic, thank you. Yeah. I'm thinking of the, the, the parallel processing company. Um, anyways, this was the, mo the model where he had used where um, you could basically upload, upload a GNU Radio flow graph design it would optimize your flow graph using their software and give it back to you. And if you wanted that, it was a subscription-based service. Anyways, I, I could probably keep going, but um, let me get those back to Tim real quick. Or, or give these guys a chance to come. Yeah, sorry. I, I'll, I'll go to the next question. I, I feel like that was pretty comprehensive. Yeah. All right, just a, a real com quick comment. In my experience, um, I haven't seen a product-based business uh, model uh, take off with what we've had so far. And, and I think that was the thrust of your question, is how would we do that? The most value that I have seen that GNU Radio has provided in organizations is a way to much more quickly and cheaply get to the products they're doing without GNU Radio. So as, a, um, as an accelerated uh, design cycle where you can prototype using you know, laptops and usurps and GNU Radio, uh, get your algorithms tested uh, over the air and, and work out all the kinks, then go you know, miniaturize to a board or an ASIC or, or you know, some kind of design instead of jumping to that as the first thing. So again, in my experience, that's not a product-based business. It's, well, maybe you're in a product-based business, but you're using GNU Radio as a tool to cut out however many weeks of, uh, of development time because you can use it uh, you know, for all your R&D or for a big chunk of the R&D all the way up at the front end. So that's the first one I mentioned, right? Is using yeah. GNU Radio as part of the workflow. I, I, not, I've, just, yeah. I've seen that very, very commonly. Yep. All right. Actually, one. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> one thing that is a true statement: like everyone who's been really involved in the Green Radio project, as in like been a long time contributor, has no problems on the job market. Like that is a true statement. Like they like I dare anyone to raise their hand and say it worked differently for them. So that's not what Manuel asked. Like there's no product coming out of that. But for, as an individual contributor, it pays off. All right. Change it up again. A little more lighter. Is Pi Bombs really worth the effort, given how troublesome it is? Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> One guess. Martin? The answer is yes. Next question. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Mr. Secretary, okay. can you answer the question? All right. No, I still think the answer is yes, and I will qualify it. Um, the, um, the, you know, like, I'm not gonna lie, like it, Pi Bombs has a whole bunch of bugs. Like even if you go to the, the bug tracker, like it has like I think 19 open issues. And, like half of them were opened by myself. I'm like, oh man, I really need to fix this at some point in, in, in time. How do we get, get to a stable um, place? Well, maybe over time it'll mature. If you guys help, chip in with some code, that'll, that'll go a long way. Do most but, people know what Pi Bombs is? I'm just, I'm, I'm, like, just, raise your hand real quick if you understand and know what Pi Bombs is. Okay, just wanted to make sure. I think that's can, a good majority. And can, you, can we get a show of hands for people who have tried to use Pi Bombs and failed? Oh, nice. <laughs> oh. Okay. Going, sorry. So um, we tried solving a, a hard problem with Pi Bombs, and I'm gonna I'm gonna argue for those people who use like Linux, and then I want to install GNU Radio and like a couple out of tree modules. You're fine. Like I I don't think that's like really broken. Um, so um, the alternative, what's the alternative? Um, the alternative is to do everything by hand. Um, and I think that's, a, that's quite a barrier for those people who, who, we, who we're trying to sort of get involved, right? So, um, and um, when I was um, working at KIT uh, teaching, like it was always like a um, objective of us to give people like a whole a setup basically like start at the point where you write C++ code that does the DSP. And, and don't start at the point where you're like, oh, okay, first of all, you do 
CMake dot on and then someone comes, no, no, you have to do CMake dash D CMake install prefixes. Well, like I want to take away all of that and put it in one tool, and then out of that came PyBombs. And um, now making that run smoothly across all the distros that exist, and also OSs, right? I mean, Mac is kind of working at this point, but Windows, I don't know. If we, I, ho I hope we'll get there at some point. Um, but just like having that unified tool where it says, Look, this is the one command that you run, and then you will have a default radio installation available, uh, installation available at you, I think is very, very, very valuable. Because, because then we can start, like the tutorials at step one, it's just like, you know, all of this is now there, um, you can just you know, fiddle with this function, and then you're writing DSP code, which I think excites most people most. And um, Python, and sorry, uh, G, uh, PyBombs and GRModule are kind of like similar, they're like, they're like brothers, and no one complains about GRModule. You know, like six years ago, it was also like buggy, and now, like who, like who writes out of two modules these days without GM module? I mean, you do? Okay, but you're crazy, like you don't have. <laughs> Nick McCarthy. Really? Nick for, McCarthy. for reference, the person who raised his hand is the original author of Volk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. All right, so the answer is yes from you. Jonathan? Well, I'm gonna echo mostly what he said. Uh, Pybombs, of course, has problems, uh, far fewer than it did even a year ago. The alternative is much worse. Uh, one of the things, of course, in the Linux community that they solved, you know, a decade ago uh, was packaging, where you can smoothly, you know, apt install or whatever, um, you know, packages and it pulls in dependencies and you have maintainers that go through and do the steps to create these binary packages and for the most part it works pretty smoothly. But that's per, for a specific OS, right? Right. In the GNU radio world with out-of-tree modules, uh, nobody does that. No, nobody writes dev files for their out-of-trees, or at least I've never seen that. And so PyBombs is a way of solving that problem on how to get that source code, and that's usually all it's ever distributed as, of course, is a, a source code, compile it, pull in the dependencies that it needs, get the GNU Radio um, version or uh, modules that it needs, um, and get back to the point where you could safely, hey, I just want to install this out of tree, and it all happens. We're not there yet. But the problem is real. Um, there's really no other solution than to finish this. Uh, we're just not quite there yet. All right. Do you feel that your question was answered appropriately, Marcus? So the problem is that there were three questions leading up to that question. So I, 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 Marcus, I transcribed the rest of your questions. Tim has them. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, I see. So you can, you can preempt them if you want, but wait, Tim. So what? He had an order of questions that was not asked appropriately, I think. I didn't realize the, they but. were specifically ordered. I'll give you a hug later, Marcus. Marcus is kind of an officer of the foundation, so he can, <laughs> so, he can so, speak now. <laughs> so I'm allowed to stand up while speaking. So um, yeah, I, I totally agree that that's a hard problem, right? So. Um, what most people actually want is to apt get install in radio. So um, what we probably are going to do in the nearer future is nightly builds, nightly build packages, which kind of feels like intuitive. We know how to do that. Like I know that Atis would like to have nightly UHD builds. I know why that fails so far. Um, it's Marxist. Fault. Yeah, it's my fault. So. Um, um, and as soon as we have that, the question is, okay, so we're now packaging UA, uh, GNU Radio for like Ubuntu, Debian, because that falls out of the same package. Fedora is not any more effort at that point. So the main, like 90% of our Linux users are probably well served and the Arch people, like they don't care probably, uh, they build themselves. So, so at that point, uh, one wonders, okay, so everyone's using like GR Osmo SDR and like Fedora and uh, Ubuntu also package that. So if we replace the Ubuntu package, the radio package with our own, we're breaking GR Osmo SDR for the people that used to install that through Ubuntu. So we are best off if we also package that. But at that point, like, why not package all of Seagram and make hold the whole packaging code part of the module uh, template? So, and then the question would be, would that not make Pi bombs for 99% of the use cases obsolete? So, so, right, if we, so is it valuable to package up out of tree modules? So I'm gonna argue that's, that's a lot of work. And um, so it's not like we could just like, oh, well, I could just do like 10 minutes of work and then I've replaced all of Pi bombs. So that's like one reason not to do that. 
And the other one is that works fine for consumers of the code. I think for developers, there's a different um, mentality. I was like, so I did a PyBombs tutorial. That's, that was why I was late. It was leading right up to the panel. Um, and one of the use cases I showed of how I was like, I install like my three branches of UHD and then switch back and forth between, or like run them in parallel without. And that's, that's you know, so much easier if you, um, or let's say that would be much more complicated with a, with a packaging model. If you're just a consumer of GR radar or GR satellites or GR whatever, then sure, that, that works fine. Except now we'd also have to like do a lot of work to do the packaging. And until there's something about packaging, it doesn't actually, it's not a one-time effort. It's not like you write a script for Ubuntu and it'll work forever. Like you also have to maintain that. Okay, I, I think we could talk about that a long, long time. Yep. All right, we'll move on. We don't have too yeah. much time left, correct? Um, but I do want to ask. Uh, 15 minutes. Oh, okay, we got plenty of time. Okay. All right. Um, this one uh, uh, goes back to more out of tree modules. So uh, imagine we have several out of tree modules with actual improvements that could be core GNU radio improvements. What, how, how would you, how can you incentivize the developer of that out of tree module that might? be consistently maintaining it and keeping it up to date, how do you incentivize him to actually push it back into the core? I'll, I'll go ahead and take that real quick, uh, unless you... Uh, no, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I deal with a lot of this. We have people uh, you know, that will have developed things um, out of tree that uh, you know, they'll ask us, you know, hey, is this worth upstreaming? And there's, there's a variety of motivations for it. Part of it is, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Um, can you guys take this over? And in some cases, we think, yeah, that's great. You know, the maintenance issue is not uh, a big deal. We've had some code in GNU Radio um, that has lasted unchanged for 10 years. Um, the uh, comedy ADC or the PCI ADC drivers has been unchanged for 10 years. Um, they, <clears throat> the maintenance requirement for contributed code doesn't go away once it's contributed. Um, the uh, willingness of authors to continue to own the code and notify us, hey, you know, this latest change makes this thing that I'm maintaining break. Uh, and you know, here's how we should fix that. And having an active maintainer of the code is a big deal. Um, the uh, situation where somebody hands over code and then it sits in the tree and nobody works on it, nobody fixes bugs, I'm staring at control port here, um, or, or thrift. Um, that's something I like to avoid, and I like to avoid it in the very beginning and saying, you know, we're not going to merge this unless there's a clear commitment to maintain it. So I, I don't have like a real clear cut answer. Um, was that your question, Mark? Yes. All right. I'll, I'll, when, he, when he turns it back to you, I'll let you comment. But um, the maintenance effort for contributed code only starts when it gets contributed. Uh, then it's up to us to, you know, do all the QA tests pass, okay, they don't, and then have to go figure out, you know, things that break, uh, or um, get in touch with the original author to say, what were you thinking on this? Oh, okay, now we understand this is how to fix it, that, that sort of thing. So I guess in a nutshell, it's active maintainership versus throwing it over the wall. Um, do you have a clear line of what that active maintainership is? It's just something you decide, okay, this guy has actually kept this up to date because he's committing once a week. Or, I mean, if he's contacting us and not the other way around. Okay. I mean, if we have to go out to a, a contributor and they, you know, they're not active enough to where they're sure. contacting us, that's, that's kind of the line right there. That's fair. So that question was a combination of Mortz's and one from Martin, but I'll let you follow up. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned the ongoing maintenance effort, but um, w w one thing that, like, again, in kernel we do everything different, so, but, but, <laughs> Um, the fact that you have like all this distributed code in the out of tree modules um, makes it really hard for a core developer to to actually figure out potential for refactoring, potential for discovering that you actually break things when you change stuff because it's all out there and you'd have to every time you change something go and test every single out of tree module. So I, I think it's maybe a bit short-sighted to say like this initial effort of like taking the contribution uh, is too much work because like, like this you push off the work to all the people that maintained out of three modules, but you also give up the potential for actually realizing that you can refactor code and might pull in stuff. I mean, there might be like, 
you know, like three different copies out there where people like split a stream into two streams and everyone reinvents it and you wouldn't know as a core. And, and at that point you want to pull it into core, but you don't know because everyone has it on their GitHub, right? And so I, I think it might be something to look at. So, and go ahead. Yep. I, did you have a follow up comment? Yeah, and also like for me as a developer that develops an out of tree module, uh, sort of, it's not only that I throw it over the wall and I'm done. It, it, it's, yeah, I, I get sort of my incent, my incentive to contribute would also be that I don't have to constantly update my out of tree module. And whether I do the maintenance in tree by like talking to you or whether it, I do it on my GitHub, I think you might get people to contribute more by just having it in tree. So um, I'm, I'm gonna sort of just offensively answer this because so Moritz and I argue all the time, so just, just in case you're, so I'm not, I don't want to feel bad about like, uh, um, like throwing this back at you. And so the Linux kernel maintainer, they have like millions of dollars to go into the development, and all I ever hear from, hear from the Linux is like, we don't have enough subsystem maintainers. Now, scaling it down to Radio, where it's like more like zero dollars going into the development, no, that's not fair. Let's say, let's say a couple of thousands if you like count like fractions of my salary, for example, that I spend on GRUHD. Um, then, you, then we have even, you know, we have even fewer subsystem maintainers. So that's, that's the first difference to the Linux kernel. The second one is that we have people like, um, uh, what was his name, GR Outernets um, guy? Like oh, you Daniel, know, Daniel. Yeah. Daniel. So like this was probably a hobby thing of his. If we sort of, um, like what, what's his incentive to do extra work on like keeping this maintained? Like he doesn't make money off this. Like he wanted to work with hack on outernets. I'm, maybe that's not true, but I'm just gonna postulate that that's what he wanted to do. He just wanted to hack on outernets. Like he wanted to write the code. Like he, he does not have interest in maintaining um, uh, like the code for a long, long time. And a good, a good example of where that kind of failed, I'm gonna look, I'm looking at you guys, is um, GR um, Specs, which was probably like the first popular out of tree module. Like it got used by a lot of people, but um, like we had to like carry it through like three iterations of the GNU Radio API, and eventually like it's sort of like, I don't know if it even compiles right now, but it, but um, maybe, maybe we should have upstreamed that. Like, you know, and I'm, I was involved in that, so I don't feel bad about pointing out, but, um, that's, I think, an example of where, where it would have worked. But like, at the time, like, like these were like individual, like undergraduate projects. Like, th those aren't people who have like an incentive of like having like it maintained because they they're not going to make money off of it. Like, like they're doing that in the kernel book. All right. Anything else? If not, let's go ahead. Oh, here we go. It's very easy to sell to my employer that upstreaming stuff in the kernel is a good idea because I can always say once it's in there, someone else will maintain it, which is a lie, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but but, but um, I think it's also much harder to break things. I mean, once you have a nightly build, right, you, you have a pull request, you run your build bot against it, you know it breaks something. So. I'm not sure that that like when you review the code that other people submit, it's much easier to detect to detect that you break it, right? So I'm not convinced that it rotting away in tree is actually that much. I mean, it will always compile, right? Because if you're build bot running, I mean, it might not work, but it will always compile. And having code that doesn't work is probably sad, but if it doesn't break other things, as soon as someone cares about it, they'll probably make it work again. Well, you don't know what's broken if there's not QA tests to test it in that automated uh, framework. And we get a lot of contributions that have zero QA. And that's, I mean, it's, it's an old argument. Uh, we have a, a rather vigorous build bot system now, thanks to uh, Andre. And uh, it, it's only as good as a testing effort. And we have lots of code in GNU Radio that's been contributed that doesn't work the way it originally was intended. And we don't know that until someone tries to use it and says, hey, what's wrong with this? And then we, we fix it and we write a new test and, and we have that. So your model of send it upstream and you'll know immediately if something breaks, you know, um, in practical, uh, well, in my experience so far, we don't have the test infrastructure written for those things that would tell you that answer. So do you have nightly builds? For for, for we do. The uh, we have we well we have uh, every pull request goes through you know like seven builds now, uh, and then uh, once a week uh, we have a full you know like fifteen different configuration builds, 
Uh, we have our automated Colverity analysis. Um, we're working at uh, adding the Debian ABI checker um, thing and the CPP checker. Uh, we might look into some automated Valgrind type tests. Uh, this has all happened in the last six months that we've sort of beefed up this, uh, this infrastructure. But in terms of uh, blocks that you know, have some signal processing functionality, we need to have uh, the ability to have golden input, golden output, you know, that sort of thing. And, and frankly, we, we get very little of that um, with uh, uh, contribution from the DSP side. It's a good way to start getting involved. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, another change of step. What in the scheduler can be improved? Ooh. What deficiencies does it, does it have? Yeah, this is from it. Mr. Bell again. And uh, what new features could be added to the scheduler? What is ripe for development in the scheduler? Or is it perfect? So I, I, I'm going to defer a little bit of that to, to my talk tomorrow, because I do talk about that in, in future directions in Guinea Radio. Weak. <laughs> um, but uh, so you know, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, the Guinea Radio schedule has solved the problem for many years, uh, and it's highly optimized for that problem. Um, we struggle, of course, and we just had the event stream discussion with uh, you know, bursty and timed type waveforms versus continuous you know, fire layer type things. Um, we do have uh, a problem for a long time dealing with heterogeneous computing where um, you might have embedded devices that operate in different memory spaces um, you know, to be able to get uh, data out of a GNU radio flow graph into an FPGA, uh, you know, like on a zinc uh, part or you know, dealing with DSP parts or dealing with um, <clears throat> GPUs. And so there's, there's a, a big piece missing in GNU radio for dealing with uh, multiprocessor type environments. Now I'm, I'm going to talk tomorrow about the idea of distributed computing with Guinea Radio uh, as one of the future directions. Uh, and it really highlights that Guinea Radio was born, you know, running a program as a single process on a single machine. And anytime you want to expand beyond that, um, other than the pure SMP case that we get for free from Linux, uh, you have to go through a lot of gyrations. We have two minutes left. We only have a couple minutes left. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, to touch on that, I, if I read the schedule right, there's a great talk on Thursday about GNU Radio and uh, OpenCPI, heterogeneous processing system. Anyway, <laughs> I, I did not set you up for that. Not my problem. I, I actually think there's open research questions. Like, I don't think anyone on the planet knows exactly what the perfect SDR schedule will look like, given a certain architecture and threading and cores, et cetera. So I, I think there's like full PhD theses that could be written about a better schedule or so. Yep. Um, yeah. The, the most that, yeah. informative thing I think that we could get from users is, this is what I want to do and I can't. Now we have a problem to solve. When we get here, I would like to make this change. Well, we don't know if that's a good change or a bad change, if it's easy or if it's hard. But if we have, I can't do this. This is why it's important to me that I do this and your software won't let me. Now we've got a problem to solve. But in your, so in your mind, number one would be heterogeneous Flowing data to heterogeneous processors too would be timed, or uh, time, uh, time diversity. diversity. Yeah, I mean uh, we have out of tree solutions to that, yeah. um, but uh, I think fundamentally we could do a lot better, uh, a lot better than TSPs. Um, the the design of Guinea Radio is to write a single process application that has a bunch of blocks working, um, you know, within one process. Anytime you want to extend that. You know, you can't run the GUI on another side or another machine, or you need to integrate GPUs and, and FPGAs. Um, you know, the whole RF knock integration. You know, we, we have to do a lot of work to get outside of that. And so, some of the fundamental growth in that side of thing, uh, I think, is to make it easier for people to write GNU radio programs that span more than just one process on one SMP cluster, uh, whatever that architecture turns out to be. Got anything else, Ben, on that topic? Uh, no, I think I have a longer list of, I've already said this to Jonathan, that's why I laughed when the question was asked. I have a long list of stuff that I like to see in the scheduler. Uh, heterogeneous computing is one, distributed computing is another, our ability to, to, to use zero copy in any way. Um, uh, there's, uh, yeah, I go on for a while. There's stuff that actually Jonathan and I disagree on. I would like uh, more intelligent handling of NUMA systems. Um, I think Jonathan is more or less kind of happy with yeah. num access control. Yeah. So uh, 
I think there's a, there's a lot of areas in the scheduler I would like to see improved. Um, for the most part, I agree with Jonathan's um, comment about wanting to know what applications can you not build with the existing scheduler and use that as a starting point. I think we differ a little bit in that I would like to, um, I have, a, I have a, lo a long list of things that I can imagine and I want to have all of them and then create this like dream product roadmap to go after rather than like tackling specific application points. Um, so yeah, maybe a little bit different philosophy there. But yeah, and, and especially in terms, and it all goes back to Jonathan's original point. Gradio started in 2001. Most people were running single core machines. You were creating, actually when Gradio first existed, your entire application, every single block was a single thread. A little different now, every block has its own thread, that kind of thing. But um, you just imagine where it came from and how that might map to what computing architectures look like today. It doesn't look good, in my opinion. So I, I think there's a lot of work to be done. All right, well, uh, let's call it quits and wrap it up. Let's give these guys a hand for standing up here. All right, awesome. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Thanks, guys. So that, that wraps up today. Uh, starting at 6 o'clock, the bar opens in 15 minutes. The bar opens on the beach. Uh, it is open until 7.30, and you all should have gotten a drink ticket when you checked in. You can use your drink ticket. It's also a cash bar. But use your drink ticket, grab a drink. Um, there is not food. The idea is everyone goes down, grabs a drink, talks a little bit, and then we kind of self-organize getting dinner. Uh, that's it for today. I will see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>